Harper Collins and Harper Audio present Warriors Super Edition Tall Stars Revenge by Aaron Hunter. Performed by Kirby Hayborn. Prologue The dark moor rose to meet the night black sky. Starry pelts sparked like flint against the trembling heather. Grass streamed around the paws of Wind Clan's former warriors as they sat, whiskers stiff, unbowed by the wind. Welcome to Star Clan, Heather Star. A sleek Tom with starshine glowing in his pelt faced the young Wind Clan leader. I have watched you serve your clanmates with bravery and loyalty as their deputy, and now I am honored to give you a life as their leader. Heatherstar dipped her head. Thank you, Thrushpelt. I died a medicine cat, the Tom reminded her. But before that, I was a warrior. I never hesitated to fight for what I knew to be right, however hard that seemed. I give you your eighth life and, with it, the courage to trust your instincts. When your heart speaks, listen. Leaning forward, he touched his nose to Heatherstar's head. As the new life pulsed through her, the gray cat groaned through clenched jaws. Thrushpelt stepped back and glanced over his shoulder. Daisy Tail? A light brown she cat with ginger patches padded from among her clanmates, her fur blazing with silver light. Do you know me? She gently asked Heatherstar. Heatherstar lifted her head and drew in a shuddering breath. Yes, I have heard your name many times. You refused to let your kits fight against Shadow Clan, and your insistence was so strong, it became part of the clan code. Daisy Tail nodded. From then on, no kit was allowed to train for battle before they were six moons old. I would have taken on each of those Shadow Clan warriors myself before I let my little ones suffer a single blow. Even though you do not have kits of your own, Heather Star, I want you to share the strength of my conviction. For your ninth life, I give you the force of a mother's love. Use it to protect your clan. She pressed her muzzle to Heather Star's head. It is stronger than the wind and outlasts life itself. Heather Star rocked as a spasm gripped her. She lurched forward and stumbled onto her knees. A mottled gray-brown Tom stepped forward. Heather Star? He leaned down to the new Wind Clan leader. Are you okay? Daisy Tail flicked her tail. She is strong, Hawkheart. I can feel it. Heather Star straightened up. I'm fine, she told the Tom. Trembling, she faced Star Clan. I promise that I will make Wind Clan a force to be respected among all the clans of the forest. I will lead them well through my nine lives. And when I join you, I hope you will welcome me with pride at what I have achieved. Murmurs of approval rose among the ranks of starry pelts. Remember, Daisy Tail called. There is no power stronger than love. As she spoke, Star Clan blurred and began to spiral upward like a comet's tail into the midnight sky. We should return to the moonstone, Hawkheart murmured in Heather Star's ear. Heather Star shook her head. I'm not ready to leave, Star Clan. Hawkheart watched the glimmering pelts fade. But they've gone. Their scent remains. Heatherstar swished her tail stubbornly. Then I'll meet you at Mothermouth when you wake. Turning, Hawkheart padded down the slope, his pelt melting into the shadows until he was hardly visible against the heather. The clan will be waiting for us at home. I won't be long. Heatherstar watched the medicine cat vanish. Still unsteady, she climbed the moor, moving slowly at first, but growing stronger with each step 
as the new lives throbbed beneath her fur. She broke into a run, charging across the windswept grass, her whiskers flattened against her face. She stopped suddenly as the moor dropped away. Balancing at the edge of the sandy precipice, Heatherstar gazed across woods and meadows stretching into darkness. Paw steps sounded behind her. Why do you linger here? The mew was soft. Heatherstar turned, blinking. The fading pelt of an ancient warrior shimmered in front of her. I wanted to breathe the sense of Star Clan for a while longer, she confessed. Who, who are you? I am Mothflight. The she-cat's green eyes shone. Behind her, the heather showed through her coat. Her pelt, once white, now glowed dimly, more starlight than fur. Mothflight? Heatherstar's eyes widened. You were Wind Clan's first medicine cat. Mothflight nodded. You discovered the moonstone, Heatherstar whispered. And now you've come to see me? I watched your naming ceremony, Mothflight told her and waited for the others to leave so that I could speak with you alone. Do you have a prophecy for me? Heatherstar curled her claws excitedly into the peaty soil. Not a prophecy, no. A warning, perhaps. Mothflight's voice was hardly more than a breath on the wind. Heatherstar leaned closer, ears pricking. Listen carefully, Heatherstar, Mothflight insisted. Whatever happens, do not demand the loyalty of your clan. Heatherstar lifted her head in surprise. Of course I'll demand it, I've earned it. Warriors must decide for themselves where their loyalty lies. It should lie with the clan and with me, Heatherstar hissed. But you cannot test it. Heatherstar bristled. I'm their leader. Mothflight's tail twitched. You are young. Wisdom will come with experience. Until then, let my words guide you. Heatherstar snorted. I will make the decisions for my clan. Of course, Mothflight soothed. But you don't yet realize that sometimes warriors must leave what they love before they understand what they truly value. Leave what they love? Heatherstar echoed. Do you mean their clan? Mothflight stared back silently. Warriors who leave their clan betray their clan, Heatherstar spat. My clan will be loyal. There will be a warrior whose loyalty to Wind Clan will waver, Mothflight told her. A cat who will have to seek far beyond the confines of your territory to discover where his heart truly lies. Heatherstar curled her lip. Are you telling me that one of my clan will turn rogue? Mothflight blinked, her eyes like green stars. He will stray, and you must let him, even if you fear he will never return. It is the only way he will discover where he truly belongs. Chapter One be careful, Tallkit. Tallkit paused when he heard Pale Bird's anxious call. I'll be okay, he mewed. He glanced back at the nursery. The warm, milky scent of his mother drifted from the entrance. Inside the thick gorse den, Brackenwing soothed her. Barkit and Shrewkit will watch out for him, I promise. Tallkit shivered. This was only his second sunrise outside the nursery, and his paws pricked with excitement. A light dusting of snow had turned the camp white, frosting the tussocky grass and thick heather walls. The freezing air stung his nose. He fluffed up his fur. Bark Kit pawed at the white tip of Tall Kit's black tail. You look like you're turning to ice as well. Tall Kit flicked his tail away, purring with amusement. 
his white muzzle and white paws would just make it easier for him to hide in the snow. Shrew Kit bounced past him. Let's show him the hunting stones, Bark Kit. Tall Kit stared at his den mates. They were three moons older and twice his size, but he was determined to keep up with them. I thought we were going to climb Tall Rock again, he protested. I know I'll make it this time. His eyes stung in the bright, cold air. He'd only opened them for the first time a few sunrises ago, and they were still slowly adjusting to sunlight after the cozy gloom of the nursery. He blinked up at the high slab of granite where Barkit had told him Heatherstar stood to address the clan. It loomed, jagged and dark, from a wide, sandy crater which encircled it like an empty pool, the meeting hollow. Tall Kit gazed into it wide-eyed. At the bottom, Heatherstar, Hawkheart, and Reedfeather huddled beside the stone, their breath billowing as they spoke. Hawkheart looked up and caught Tall Kit's eye over the rim. Our youngest Kit is exploring again, he murmured. Tall Kit shifted his paws. The dark glint in the medicine cat's gaze made him nervous. Pale Bird had warned him to stay away from the gray-brown Tom. He had little patience for Kits. Stay undercover, Tall Kit, Hawkheart narrowed his eyes. We don't want you attracting buzzards to the camp. Buzzards? Tall Kit's heart lurched. Kits are their favorite prey, Hawkheart warned, and they can spot you from high stones. Reedfeather's whiskers twitched. Don't scare the poor Kit. There was a purr in his throat as he nodded to Shrew Kit, who had popped up beside Tall Kit. What are you showing him today? Shrew Kit flicked his tail. The honey stones? Heatherstar shook frost from her thick gray pelt. Be careful, she cautioned. The stones will be icy. Don't come mewling to me if you sprain a paw, Hawkheart called. Come the Wind Clan leader urged her deputy in Medicine Cat. It's too cold to sit here. Let's go to my den. As Heather Star hopped out of the meeting hollow, Hawkheart and Reedfeather followed, their tails twitching as they ducked into the shelter of the leader's den beneath a gorse bush at the far end of the clearing. Can we play sliding in the hollow? Bark Hit mewed. I want to go to the hunting stones, Shrew Kit insisted. He scraped up a pawful of snow and flung it at Barkit. The wind snatched the flakes and tossed them back into his whiskers. As he sneezed, Barkit purred with amusement. Wow, you're scary. I'll show you. Shrewkit hurled himself at his brother and sent him rolling over the grass. Talkit backed away as their dark brown pelts scuffed the snow. It must be fun to have a littermate to play fight with. If only Finch Kit hadn't died. Shrew Kit leaped free of his brother's grip. Look at Tall Kit, he teased. He's blinking like he just opened his eyes. Tall Kit bristled. I'm nearly half a moon old, and Sandgorse says I open my eyes quicker than any kit in the nursery. He glared at his den mates. I'm just not used to snow. The ground sparkled, and the heather that formed the camp boundary, so dark against the sky yesterday, now glittered brightly with frost. What would the moor look like when the heavy snows came and the world turned completely white? Palebird had warned Tall Kit that Leaf Bear hit Wind Clan hardest of all the clans because the moor touched the sky. But this also made them more special and safer. We're closer to Silver Pelt than any clan, she'd told him as she snuggled him in their mossy nest. Which means that Star Clan watches us more closely. Tall Kit heard worry in her mew. Is that why we tunnel under the moor? He asked. To hide from the dead warriors and other clans? Don't be silly, Pelbert had licked his ear. We tunnel because we're stronger and cleverer than all the other clans together. Her washing became brisker, silencing him. 
I'm going to the Honey Stones. True Kit charged across the grass. Bark Hit raced after him. What about sliding in the hollow? There's not enough snow for real sliding. Shrew Kit veered away from Tall Rock. You're just scared. Bark Hit swerved after his brother, sending a shower of frozen flakes up from his paws. Am not, Shrew Kit called back. Tall Kit followed, not caring where they chose to play. It felt great to be outside, the grass cold on his pads as he raced across it. Watch out! Talkit skidded to a halt as Cloud Runner yowled at him. The pale gray Tom was crossing his path with Aspenfall. The warriors were heading to the prey heap, carrying fresh kill. Wind ruffled from the moor, they'd brought food for the clan. Talkit gazed at them, impressed by their long legs and wiry tails. They were moor runners, which meant they served Wind Clan by hunting and patrolling the borders and Talkit could smell heather on their pelts. In the brittle patch of bracken where the tunnelers made their nests, Woolly Tail looked up from washing his mud-streaked belly. Like all the cats who served the clan by carving out new tunnels and shoring up old ones far beneath the moor, his pelt was permanently stained with sand and dust. He nodded at the rabbit swinging from Cloud Runner's jaws. Did you catch that on the high moor? Yes. At the prey heap, Cloud Runner kicked away a stale mouse left from the previous day's hunt and dropped his catch. You're right as usual, Woolly Tail. Tall Kit blinked at Woolly Tail. How did you know? I can smell the sand in its fur. Woolly Tail flicked his tail and returned to washing. Hickory Nose, his tunnel mate, shifted on the bracken beside him. You only find sand tunnels on the high moor. The brown tom lifted a forepaw and rubbed dirt from his ear. Not like the gorge tunnel. That's all soil and grit, but it'll open the way to fresh prey beside the river. Cloud Runner snorted. If you ever find a way to stop the cave-ins. Aspenfall laid a vole beside the rabbit. The grit makes it unstable. It's not safe to tunnel there. Woolly Tail narrowed his eyes. It is if you know what you're doing. Tall Kit glanced from tunneler to moor runner as an awkward silence fell between them. Heatherstar cut through it. She padded from her den and followed the rim of the meeting hollow. Passing the grass nests of the moor runners, she brushed by Cloud Runner and stopped beside the bracken patch. Will the new tunnels be ready before New Leaf, Woolly Tail? Woolly Tail sniffed. It takes time to shore up the roofs. Heatherstar flicked her tail. I'm sure you'll find a way. She turned back to the prey heap and sniffed Cloud Runner's rabbit. Does Heatherstar ever patrol underground? Tall Kit watched the Wind Clan leader curiously. She'd trained as a moor runner, but surely as leader, she needed to understand what it was like to be a tunneler too. Hurry up, Tall Kit, Bark Kit called. Tall Kit jerked his attention away and scurried after his den mates. Bark Kit and Shrew Kit were already at the hunting stones. The smooth, low rocks huddled like rabbits in the grass near the elder's den. Sprigs of heather poked between them and moss clumped at their base. Shrew Kit leaped onto the highest stone and crowed down at Bark Kit. I am leader of the hunting stones. Barkit scrambled onto the boulder beside him. I'm deputy. Talkit reached the rocks and waded through the thick moss at the bottom. Reaching up with his forepaws, he kicked out with his hind legs and tried to jump up beside Barkit. His claws slithered on the frosty stone and he slid back into the chilly moss. Hey, Wormkit! Shrew Kit called down. Why don't you tunnel underneath? You're not supposed to be a moor runner like us. Tall Kit's pelt pricked with confusion. I'm not Worm Kit. I'm Tall Kit. You're going to spend your life wriggling underground like a worm, aren't you? Shrew Kit taunted. That's where you should be now, 
under the rocks, not on them. Talkit frowned. He knew that his mother and father were tunnelers, but did that really mean he couldn't play on the hunting stones? Barkit reached down with his forepaw. Ignore him and try again, Talkit, he mewed. Talkit leaped for his denmate's paw and felt it curl beneath his own. He churned his hind legs while Barkit heaved. Scrabbling against the stone, he flung himself onto the rock. Thanks, he sat up beside Barkit, his pads stinging on the frozen rock. He gazed across the camp. Sun shone from a crisp blue sky, thawing the grassy hummocks, which bulged like clump fur across the frosty clearing. The tunneler's bracken patch glowed orange, while the long grass enclosing the moor runner's nests drooped lower as the frost slowly loosened its grip. A white face appeared at the entrance of the elder's den. You young'uns are up early. Whiteberry slid out and sat gingerly on the cold grass, a tail length from the hunting stones. Lily Whisker limped after him and stood tasting the air. She was the youngest in the elder's den, far younger than Whiteberry, Flamepelt, and Flailfoot. She'd retired to the den after a tunnel collapse, had smashed her hind leg, and left it useless. Do you want to come onto the moor? She asked Whiteberry. The white elder looked at her. So long as you don't try to get me down any rabbit holes. Not after last time, Lily Whisker purred. I've never seen a cat chased out of a tunnel by a rabbit. Whiteberry shifted his paws. I thought it was a fox. Your sense of smell must be worn out. Flicking her tail teasingly, Lily Whisker hopped toward the camp entrance. Her lifeless hind leg left a trail through the shallow snow. Whiteberry heaved himself to his paws and followed. Yours will wear out too after a few more moons sharing a den with Flailfoot. He's got fox breath. It's not that bad, Lily Whisker called over her shoulder. Do you want to swap nests? Whiteberry caught up to her. Last night he snored right in my muzzle. I dreamed I'd fallen into a badger den. As they disappeared into the heather tunnel, a pale ginger tom nosed his way past them, heading into camp. Sand gorse! Talkit lifted his tail as his father trotted into the clearing. The ginger warrior's pelt was speckled with earth. I've left a stack of sticks at the tunnel entrance, he called to Woolly Tail. The gray and white tunneler lifted his nose. Great, he meowed. We can start shoring up the roof this afternoon. You'll have to manage without me, Sandgorse headed toward the hunting stones. Talkit, I want to show you something. Talkit blinked excitedly at his father. What is it? Was Sandgorse going to show him the moor? Talkit slid off the rock and scrambled over the tussocky grass, he skidded to a halt at Sandgorse's paws. Sandgorse licked a sprig of moss from Talkit's ear and spat it onto the grass. It's time you learned to dig. Disappointment dropped like a stone in Talkit's belly. He didn't want to dig. He wanted to see the moor and feel the wind in his pelt. Talkit's going to go worming, Shrewkit jeered from the hunting stones. Talkit spun around crossly. Worms don't dig. Ignore Shrew Kit. Barkit stepped in front of his littermate. He's just teasing. Sandgore snorted. Typical Moorkit, scared of getting sand in his eyes. He headed for the tunneler's bracken patch. Talkit scrambled after him and ducked under Sandgorse's belly as he stopped beside Woolly Tail's nest. Talkit peeped out relishing the warmth of his father's fur on his spine. Do you think sticks will be strong enough to hold up the roof? Sandgorse wondered. Woolly Tail frowned. They'll do until we can roll stones into place. Perhaps we should take a different route to the gorge. Above Talkit's head, Sandgorse's belly twitched. Woolly Tail shook his head. 
We can't be far from clay now. It'll be harder digging, but there'll be fewer cave-ins. Sandgorse glanced toward the elder's den. Talkit guessed he was thinking about Lily Whisker's crushed leg. Perhaps we should explore the rabbit warrens higher up. There may be a clay seam there we can dig into. But we've made so much progress over Leaf Bear, Woolly Tail argued. It'd be a shame to start again. The Tom's muscular shoulders twitched. They were as wide and toned as Sandgorse's. Will I have shoulders like that when I'm a tunneler? Tall Kit's gaze strayed across the camp to Cloud Runner and Aspenfall. They were much sleeker, built for speed, not strength. Tall Kit wondered what it felt like to run across the moor with the wind rushing through his fur. Surely that would be better than being squashed underground? He imagined his ears and nose filling up with mud and shuddered. Come on, Talkit. Sangorse's mew broke into his thoughts. His father was heading for the moor runner's nests. Talkit scampered after him and followed him past the swishing stalks to a patch of bare earth behind Tall Rock. There's good digging here, Sandgorse explained, running his paw over the ground. This is where I first learned to tunnel. Talkit gazed down at the churned earth and wondered how many times this patch had been dug and refilled, ready for new tunnelers to practice. Don't you ever get bored of digging? He mewed. Being a tunneler doesn't just mean digging, Sandgorse retorted. Hollowing out new earth roots is part of being a tunneler, but we patrol them too, and it's a great place to hunt, especially during leaf bear. Don't forget, that's why Shattered Ice first tunneled through the rabbit warrens. Talkit already knew the legend of Shattered Ice. It was one of the first nursery stories Pellbird ever told him. Long ago, the moor was gripped by the worst leaf bear the clan had ever known. There was no prey to be found in the snow-drowned stretches of Heather and Gorse. So one of Wind Clan's bravest warriors had gone into the rabbit warrens and dug deep beyond them in search of food for their clan. He cared more for his clan than his own safety, Sandgorse meowed solemnly, and he didn't have any of the training or experience we have now. He had only his courage and strength, Talkit stifled a yawn. He had only his courage and strength, Sandgorse went on. Wind Clan has tunneled ever since, learning more with each generation, he lifted his chin. Without its tunnelers, Wind Clan would have suffered many hungry, prayless moons. Talkit's pelt pricked guiltily. How could he dream of running across the moors like Cloud Runner in Aspenfall? One day, his clan would depend on him. He should be proud to follow in his father's paw steps. Unsheathing his claws, he began to scrape at the earth sending it showering behind him. Wait, Sandgorse swept his tail over Talkit's spine. You're not digging a hole to make dirt. Talkit sat back and shook his head to dislodge some flakes of dirt. There were different ways to dig? Sandgorse thrust a paw into the soft soil and scooped out a lump of earth. Pushing it firmly to one side, he dug another, Within moments, he was hollowing out dirt, paw over paw, while a pile grew beside him, neat and compact. Talkit felt a quiver of pride. His father looked strong and determined, as if there was no hole he couldn't dig, no earth he couldn't shape with his paws. Let me try. Talkit reached down past his father and gouged out a pawful of the crumbling earth. Sandgorse sat back. Talkit felt his father's gaze on his pelt, warmer than sunshine. He dug harder, dragging up pawfuls and throwing them into a loose pile beside his fast-growing hole. I'm tunneling, he squeaked. Watch out! As Sandgorse mewed a warning, Talkit's flank bumped his dig pile. Cold, crumbly soil cascaded around his ears, it sprinkled over his muzzle, making him sneeze. He sat up, 
shaking out his fur, and stared crossly at the earth that was still showering into his hole. Sangorse pressed his paw against the pile to stop the flow. Your dig pile is as important as your hole. You must keep it compact. Press your dug earth down firmly, or you'll have to dig every pawful twice. Talkit frowned. This was harder than he thought. Concentrating, he dove back into his hole and hauled up a fresh pawful of soil. He carefully patted it into the side of his dig pile. This time, it stayed where he put it, and he reached into the hole with both paws and began scooping paw over paw, taking time to press each lump into his pile just as Sandgorse had done. Very good, tall kit. There was pride in Sandgorse's mew. Talkit swallowed back a purr and kept digging. The hole was so deep now that his hind legs ached each time he reached down. Slow down, Sandgorse warned. I'm okay. As Talkit answered, his hind paws shot out from beneath him. Muzzle first, he crashed into the hole. Pain seared through his paws as they twisted the wrong way, his claws bending back as they caught on the soil. A wave of earth smothered him, choking him and pushing him farther into the hole. Help! I'm being buried alive! Teeth sank into his tail, dragging him up. Are you okay? Sandgorse let go and stared into Talkit's face. No! Talkit's muzzle throbbed and his claws burned. I can't do this! I hate digging holes and I don't want to be a tunneler! A wail rose in his belly as soil stung his eyes. Pale bird! Chest heaving, he turned and raced for the nursery. Chapter Two Sandgorse bounded after him. You were doing really well. I was not! Anger surged through Talkit as his eyes watered from the grit. I fell in and hurt my claws. He stumbled to a halt outside the nursery and held up a paw. You just snagged them. They'll be okay. Talkit blinked through tears. You don't know that! Hazily, he spotted Pale Bird's black and white pelt at the nursery entrance. Talkit, she slid onto the grass. What happened? Talkit flung himself against her soft fur. I fell in and soil got in my eyes. He screwed them up as Pale Bird began to lap at them gently. Is that better? She paused and waited while he opened them gingerly. The stinging had stopped. He shook his head, spraying earth from his ears. I heard my paws, too. Palebird leaned down and sniffed them. They're fine, she mewed. Let's go inside. Tall kid, Sandgore stepped closer. You can't give up yet. Leave him, Palebird murmured. He's frightened. Tall kid glanced over his shoulder. Sandgorse's green eyes were round with worry. I'll try again later, he meowed reluctantly. We'll see. Pelbert nosed him gently into the den. He's got to learn. Talkit didn't hear the rest of his father's mew. Pelbert's fur was swishing in his ears as she guided him to their nest. He curled into the soft sheep's wool lining. Where's Brackenwing? Barkit's mother was gone. And Mist Mouse. The ginger queen's nest was empty, and there was no sign of rye kit, doe kit, or stag kit. Bracken wings at the prey heap. Palebird settled into the nest beside him. Mist mouse went hunting. Hunting? Queens didn't hunt. They looked after their kits. Palebird sighed. She's missed being out on the moor these past moons, and her kits don't need her anymore. The entrance to the nursery rustled as Brackenwing pushed her way in. She carried with her the scent of fresh rabbit. Who's missed the moor? Heather rustled as she settled into her nest. Missed mouse, Pelbird told her. 
Brackenwing ran her tongue around her lips. I haven't felt the wind in my fur for too long, she mewed wistfully. Tallkit nestled against Palebird. Do you miss being underground? She'd been a tunneler before he'd been born. Of course. Tallkit wasn't convinced. Who'd want to spend the day in the dark? Brackenwing flicked her tail over her paws. You won't be tunneling for a while, Palebird. The ginger queen's mew sounded ominous. Tallkit's gaze flicked anxiously toward his mother. Why not? My kitting was hard. I lost Finchkit. Pilbert shifted beside him. It'll take me a bit longer to recover. Tallkit searched her gaze. He could never tell whether his mother was sad or just tired. Why did Finchkit die? Did you kit her wrong? Hush! Brackenwing's sharp mew surprised him. Had he said something bad? Palebird liked talking about Finchkit. Did Star Clan want her? He pressed. Palebird sighed. I guess they did. But not me. Why had Star Clan left him with Palebird? Perhaps they wanted him to cheer her up. What color was Finchkit's pelt? Tallkit asked. Palebird's gaze clouded. Ginger, like your father's. I don't know why you gave Finchkit a name, Brackenwing muttered. She needed a name, Pelbert answered. She only lived for a moment, Brackenwing frowned. Star Clan would have named her. Tallkit felt his mother tremble. Talking about Finchkit didn't seem to be cheering her up. He pawed at her cheek, softly, trying to distract her. I've got sand in my ears. Have you, dear? Pilbert leaned down and began washing his ear fur. Relieved to feel her soften beside him, Tulkit snuggled closer. He didn't even remember Finchkit. Am I supposed to? A shadow darkened the nursery entrance. Have you calmed him down yet? Sandgor stuck his head through the gorse. The sooner he starts digging again, the better. I've just gotten him cleaned up, Pilbert objected. We'll practice some other skills, Sandgorse promised. Talkit ducked out from under his mother's muzzle. Are you sure it's okay? He mewed, blinking up at her. He didn't want to leave Palebird if she was still sad, but Sandgorse sounded so eager for him to go. Whatever you want, dear. Her gaze drifted away. Talkit felt a jab of disappointment. Didn't she want him to stay? He stood up. She wants me to train so I can be as strong as sand gorse. He clambered over the side of the nest. See you later. Pelbert didn't answer. She was staring blankly at the den wall. Come on, Talkit. Sandgorse brushed his way through the nursery entrance. Talkit followed. He was pleased to see his father's gaze brighten and slithered onto the snowy grass beside him. I knew one little fall wouldn't put you off. Sandgorse whisked Tallkit forward with his tail. Let's practice moving stones. Tunnelers have to learn to move rocks much heavier than themselves. Really? Tallkit scampered at his side as they crossed the camp. It's an important skill. Sandgorse nodded toward a row of rocks clustered beside the elder's den. Let's try these. Just small ones to begin with. Small ones? Tallkit stared at the stones. They were as big as sparrows. Sandgor stopped beside the nearest and beckoned Talkit closer with a twitch of his tail. Grab it with your forepaws and use your weight to roll it toward you. Talkit swallowed. Won't it squash me? The first rule of tunneling is that you're always stronger than you think, Sandgorse told him. Brown fur flashed at the corner of Talkit's gaze. I touched your tail. You're the rabbit now. Did not. Did so. Shrewkit and Barkit were chasing each other over the hunting stones. Heather sprigs quivered in their wake. Sandgorse nudged the rock toward Talkit. Roll this one. Talkit stared at it. Why do I always have to be the rabbit? You don't. 
Flattening his ears to block out the sound of his den mates playing, Talkit reached up and rested his forepaws on the rock. With a grunt, he tried to heave it toward him. His belly tightened with the effort, but the stone didn't move. Let's try a smaller one. Sangorse pushed another stone closer. As Talkit reached for it, Flailfoot padded out of the elder's den. His black pelt moved like a shadow against the frosty gorse. He's a bit young to be moving rocks, Sandgorse sniffed. It's never too early to start learning tunneling skills. Flailfoot sat down. I didn't move my first stone till I was an apprentice. Talkit gritted his teeth. I'm going to move it. Hissing under his breath, he heaved. His claws slipped. His hind legs buckled. With a gasp, he fell backward and landed on his tail. Nice move, Wormkit, Shrewkit called from the hunting stones. Tallkit turned on him, ears flat. I'm learning. Take no notice, Sandgorse advised. Shrewkit thinks like a moor runner. He doesn't understand patience. Tallkit's heart sank. Would he have to spend the whole day trying to shift this dumb rock while Shrewkit and Barkit played rabbit on the hunting stones? Heatherstar's mew rang through the cold air. Let all cats old enough to catch prey gather beneath Tall Rock. Tallkit jerked around. The Wind Clan leader stood on top of the dark stone in the middle of the meeting hollow. Wait here, Sandgorse ordered. He trotted across camp and bounded into the sandy hollow. Flailfoot brushed past Talkit. Try starting with a smaller stone, he suggested as he headed after Sandgorse. Talkit sat back on his haunches and watched his clanmates streaming toward Tall Rock. Aspen fallen Cloudrunner bounded down into the snow whitened circle, lithe and light footed. Red Claw and Dawn Stripe followed. Meadow Slip and Lark Splash were already staring up expectantly at Heatherstar. They shifted to let the other moor runners settle beside them. Sandgorse headed for the opposite end of the hollow, where the tunnelers sat, and stopped beside Woolly Tail and Hickory Nose. Flailfoot jumped stiffly down beside them. Tail high, the old tunneler nodded to Reed Feather, the Wind Clan deputy, who was sitting at the foot of Tall Rock dipped his head in return. Barkit bounced toward Talkit, eyes bright. Aren't you coming? Shrewkit was already scrambling away across the tussocks. Talkit blinked. But we're not old enough to catch prey. How do you know? Barkit shrugged. You've never tried. Besides, we won't sit with the warriors. We can watch from over there. He pointed with his nose to where Shrewkit was threading his way through the long grass that edged the moor runner's nests. Come on. As Talkit scampered after Barkit, the camp entrance shivered. Lily Whisker and Whiteberry hurried in. Have they started? Lily Whisker called to Flailfoot as she limped across camp. Not yet. Flailfoot padded to the edge of the hollow and reached up to steady Lily Whisker as she scrambled down on her three good legs. She joined the tunnelers while Whiteberry headed for the moor runners on the far side of the hollow. Mist Mouse paced the rim, brushing past her mate, Hair Flight. The brown tom stood as stiff as the trunk of a gorse bush, as though his claws had taken root. Talkit paused beside the moor runners' nests and watched them curiously. Mist Mouse's kits, Rye Kit, Stag Kit, and Doe Kit were standing beside the two warriors. In here, Bar Kit nudged Tall Kit into the grass beside Shrew Kit. Tall Kit pushed through the long stems. What are they doing at the hollow? He jerked his nose toward Hair Flight's kits. I don't know. Bar Kit burrowed deeper into the grass and peeped out. Hush, Shrew Kit hissed beside them. I'm trying to hear. His yellow eyes were fixed on the meeting hollow. Heather Star sprang down from Tall Rock and weaved past her clanmates until she reached the center. 
Mist Mouse was fiercely smoothing the fur between Stag Kit's ears. Hair Flight nudged Doe Kit and Rye Kit closer to the edge. Rye Kit, Doe Kit, and Stag Kit, Heather Star called. Tall Kit felt Bar Kit stiffen beside him. It's their apprentice ceremony. Tall Kit leaned forward. Wooly Tail will get one of them, Shrew Kit guessed. But Hair Flight's a moor runner, Bar Kit reminded him. So, Shrew Kit whispered, Wooly Tail's been complaining for ages that Wind Clan needs more tunnelers, and Mist Mouse will want at least one of her kits to follow in her paw steps. He glanced at Tall Kit. I feel sorry for you. Being a tunneler must be awful. Tall Kit scowled at him. Sandgor says it's the noblest warrior life. Sandgorse would, Shrew Kit scoffed. He's had so much mud in his ears, it's probably filled up his head. Talkit unsheathed his claws, anger surging beneath his pelt. That's not true, Barkit pressed against him softly. Just watch the ceremony, he murmured. Stagkit was leading his sisters into the hollow. Rykit's paws slipped and she slithered down the icy slope. Warm purrs rumbled around her as she straightened and shook out her soft gray fur. Rye paw, Heatherstar met her gaze. The new apprentice's eyes widened. Your mentor will be Lark Splash. Rye paw purred loudly as Lark Splash stepped from among the moor runners and touched her head with her muzzle. Heatherstar flicked her tail. Lark Splash. Share your speed and sharp eyes with Rypaw, so that she too may become a warrior worthy of Wind Clan. The Wind Clan leader turned to Dokit. Dopaw, she meowed. Your mentor will be Aspenfall. Aspenfall pricked his ears, blinking as though surprised. Dopaw's pale brown pelt prickled excitedly. She puffed out her chest as Aspenfall crossed the hollow to greet her. Aspenfall, Heatherstar meowed. Share your courage and strength with Dopaw. Aspenfall dipped his head and touched his nose to Dopaw's ear. Behind them, Stag Kit gazed at his clanmates. He must be trying to guess who his mentor will be. Tall Kit held his breath, as excited as if it were his own apprentice ceremony. It looks like poor old Stag Kit gets Wooly Tail, Shrew Kit muttered. Stag Paw, Heatherstar began. Your mentor will be Cloud Runner, Shrew Kit gasped. Cloud Runner? He's not a tunneler, Bar Kit breathed. Tall Kit felt a flash of relief for his former denmate. Stag Paw won't have to train underground. Then guilt pricked him. He should be feeling sorry that Stagpaw would never be the noblest of warriors. Heatherstar went on. Cloud Runner, share your hunting skill and agility with your apprentice, so he may feed his clans for many moons to come. Yowls of approval rose from the moor runners. Stagpaw, Rypaw, Dopaw. On the rim of the hollow, Mist Mouse and Hair Flight twined their tails together, their eyes shining with pride. Cloud Runner? Wooly Tail's mew rose above the cheers. Confusion clouded his yellow gaze. Hickory Nose narrowed his eyes. Why wasn't an apprentice given to a tunneler? He demanded. What's going on? A mew sounded from the camp entrance. A gray she cat stared at her clanmates. Her pelt was dusted with soil. Mist Mouse turned. Hi, Plum Claw. She shifted her paws uneasily as she faced her tunneling denmate. I'm afraid you missed the naming ceremony. Did Wooly Tail get his apprentice? The she cat's gaze flashed with hope. Wooly Tail shook his head. They're training as more runners. All of them? Plum Claw's eyes widened. Heatherstar stepped forward. Aspenfall, Cloud Runner, and Lark Splash are going to mentor Mist Mouse's kits. 
Plumclaw stared at Mist Mouse. Don't you want any of them to follow in your paw steps? Mist Mouse dropped her gaze. Hair flight pressed close to his mate. We've decided that we want them all to be more runners. Tunneling is dangerous work, Mist Mouse pointed out. Our kits are good runners like their father. They'll be better hunting the moors than the tunnels. Hickory Nose took a step forward, his fur bristling. But we need more tunneler apprentices. Behind him, Sandgore swished his tail. At least we'll have Tallkit in a few moons. Tallkit's belly tightened. Lucky little worm, Kit, Shrewkit teased. Tallkit glared at him. Shut up! Heatherstar padded toward the tunnelers. I know you're disappointed, but Mist Mouse and Hareflight want their kits to train as more runners. Hickory Nose met her gaze. The clan needs tunnelers as well, Heatherstar. I understand your disappointment, Heatherstar answered softly, but Leaf Shine's death is still fresh in our memories. Talkit had heard Palebird and Brackenwing talking about the tunneler killed by the same cave-in that had crippled Lily Whisker. I had to respect Mist Mouse and Hare Flight's wishes, the Wind Clan leader continued. Hickory Nose dipped his head. I guess. Heatherstar went on. When new leaf comes and the earth is drier, the tunnels will be safer and better for training. Woolly Tail pushed past Hickory Nose. Why didn't you warn us we weren't getting an apprentice? Reed Feather took a pace forward. Would you have accepted it any more easily if we had? Plum Claw called from the top of the hollow. We would have known that you still respected us. Heather Star lifted her chin. Of course, Wind Clan respects its tunnelers, she insisted. When Leaf Bear brings endless moons of snow, our tunnelers always bring us prey. We value your skills, and we want to help you keep them alive through future moons. A growl rumbled in Woolly Tail's throat. How? When you give us no apprentices to train? You will have more apprentices eventually. Heatherstar flicked her tail. For now, the ceremony is over. She turned to Cloud Runner. Show your apprentices their territory. She dipped her head to Aspenfall in Lark Splash. Train them well. Talkit felt a flicker of unease as Cloud Runner hopped out of the hollow and led Stagpaw to the camp entrance. Lark Splash, Aspenfall, Rypaw, and Dopaw bounded after them. How would the tunnelers get more apprentices? Talkit wondered. Shrewkit and Barkit would be more runners. Was Talkit going to have to keep the tunneler's skills alive all by himself? Barkit pressed close to him. Sandgorse will make sure that Heatherstar chooses a tunneler mentor when it's your naming ceremony. Yeah, Talkit tried to sound enthusiastic. Did he really want to spend the rest of his moons digging holes and heaving rocks? Redclaw, Appledon, Hair Flight! Reed Feather called to the moor runners. The prey heap is low. We must hunt. Red Claw's nose twitched. Rabbit will be easy to scent in this weather. Appledon sprang out of the hollow and headed for the entrance, her pale cream pelt rosy in the low sunshine. Hair flight raced after her. Let's hunt the high outcrops. Talkit watched the muscles ripple beneath Hair Flight's pelt as the pale brown tom reached the camp entrance in three easy bounds. Longing pricked his belly. I want to race on the moors. I want to be pulled by the wind and chase rabbits beneath the big blue sky. Would he ever feel the same way about running through tunnels in the dark? Chapter 3 Thick snow smothered the high moor, but in the camp's sheltered dip, the heather and grass was tinged green with the promise of new leaf. Talkit could feel the prick of fresh stems beneath his paws as he skimmed across the tussocks. Barkit fled ahead of him, tail whipping as he plunged down into the meeting hollow. 
tall kit reached the edge and leaped, sailing fast and high before landing skillfully and racing on without missing a paw step. Bark kit charged ahead, kicking sand in his wake. Excitement pulsed through tall kit's paws as he gained ground on his den mate. He's two moons older and I'm still faster. Talkit pushed harder as Barkit reached the far slope of the hollow and scrambled out. Talkit jumped easily up the slope, clearing it as Barkit dived for cover beneath the thick gorse beyond. He slowed to a halt, stopping a whisker from the barrage of thorns. Pelt twitching, he paced along the edge of gorse, swishing his tail. I know you're in there, Mouse. I'm going to pull your tail. Never! Barkit purred. Come out and face me, rabbit heart. Come and get me, buzzard face. The gorse rattled as Barkit scrabbled deeper. Talkit ducked and peered under the branches. I'm coming. A paw pressed on his tail. Going tunneling, worm kit? True kit snorted. Talkit spun around, bristling. Will you drop the dumb name? He squared his shoulders. But it suits you, True Kit's eyes gleamed. You're going to spend your life burrowing underground. Ignore him, Tall Kit, Bark Kit called from under the gorse. Let's finish our game. Tall Kit held Shrew Kit's gaze. Why don't you join us? Playing was better than arguing. I'm too old for Kit's games. Tall Kit prickled with frustration. Then why don't you go hunting with Red Claw? He leaned closer. Oh, I forgot. You're too young to leave camp. The gorse trembled as Barkit pushed his way out. Stop acting like a paw, Shrew Kit. You've got three moons left before you get your apprentice name. Shrew Kit puffed out his fur. I don't see why I have to wait. I'm nearly as big as Doe Paw. No kit can be apprenticed before six moons. Talkit reminded him, don't you know the warrior code? Shrewkit flicked his tail. Do tunnelers have a code? Talkit flexed his claws. We're warriors too, he snapped. We train to hunt and fight like more runners. We just have extra skills. Do you mean digging? Shrewkit sneered. Rabbits can dig. It's not such a great skill. Yes, it is, Talkit felt a rush of fury. Sandgorse is helping to build a tunnel right down to the bottom of the gorge. No rabbit could do that. No rabbit would even think of it. He fluffed out his pelt, hoping his anger would hide the fear that was pricking through his fur at the thought of squeezing down such a long, long tunnel. Tunnels are a waste of time, Shrewkit scoffed. They're only good for hiding in. No, they're not! How dare Shrewkit suggest that tunnelers were cowards? Being underground was far scarier than running around the moor. The new tunnel means an extra prey run and a secret route in and out of our territory if we ever need it. Real warriors don't need secret routes. They stay in the open and fight. Talkit lashed his tail. Tunnelers can fight underground! I'm just saying I'm glad I don't have to be a tunneler's apprentice. Don't tell me you're looking forward to spending your life in the dark. I'm proud to follow in Sandgorse's paw steps. Talkit shifted his paws guiltily. I just wish I wasn't dreading it. Barkit nosed his way between them. I don't know why you're arguing, he mewed. It's okay to want different things. If we all wanted to be more runners... We'd be just the same as Thunder Clan or Shadow Clan or River Clan, but we're not. We're Wind Clan, and we can fight and hunt and tunnel. Talkit swallowed his frustration. Barkit was right. Wind Clan cats were special, and it was mouse brained to stand around arguing about it. Whipping his tail, he turned and stomped away. Sharp pain stabbed his paw. Ow! He lifted it, hopping. His pad stung like fury. Barkit bounded over. What's wrong? I stepped on something sharp. Talkit held out his paw. 
Barkit crouched and peered at the pad. Gently, he tipped it up to get a better look. It's a gorse thorn, he mewed. Talkit glanced nervously toward the medicine den. Should I ask Hawkheart to get it out? If Hawkheart was busy, he wouldn't want to be disturbed, especially by buzzard prey. No need. Leaning close, Barkit pressed his muzzle to Talkit's pad. Talkit felt his den mate's breath warm on his paw. Then there was a sharp tug, and the pain melted away. Barkit sat up, a long thorn stuck from between his teeth. Blood glistened on the tip. He spat it out. Lick your paw really hard, he ordered. That'll stop it from going bad. Talkit lifted his paw and examined the pad. A spot of blood was welling where Barkit had removed the thorn. He lapped it, amazed at how quickly the pain had disappeared. The blood tasted salty on his tongue. Thanks, Barkit. He looked at his friend. How did you know what to do? Barkit shrugged. It was obvious. Truekit rolled his eyes. Brilliant, he snorted. That's really going to help catch rabbits or fight invaders. Barkit tipped his head on one side. There's more to life than hunting and fighting. Is there? Shrewkit blinked in surprise. Don't tell me you want to be a tunneler. That's not what I said, Barkit mewed. Another digger! Shrewkit turned his tail on his brother. He clearly wasn't listening. That's just what Wind Clan needs. Barkit watched his brother march away. Talkit narrowed his eyes, confused. Don't you want to be a moor runner, Barkit? No, I want to train as a medicine cat, Barkit confessed. Talkit stared at him. Really? I'm going to ask Heatherstar if I can be apprenticed to Hawkheart. Hawkheart? Talkit echoed in astonishment. I'd rather train as a tunneler. Are you sure? Yes, Barkit's eyes shone. I can't wait to learn about all the herbs and how to treat different injuries. I can't imagine Hawkheart with an apprentice. Do you think he'll refuse to train me? Worry clouded Barkit's gaze. Maybe that's why he's never had an apprentice before. No one's been brave enough to volunteer, Talkit muttered. He purred. He'll probably be impressed by your courage. Hawkheart's okay. Barkit's anxious gaze slid toward the medicine den. He just doesn't like being asked rabbit-brained questions, that's all. Then how will you learn anything? Talkit pointed out. I'll watch what he does and only ask questions when I'm sure I don't understand. Talkit blinked, surprised by how determined Barkit sounded. He must have been planning this for ages. Sadness pricked his chest. We'll never train together. You're training as a tunneler anyway, Barkit reminded him. I'll have to learn to hunt and fight, and you would have learned basic tunnel skills. Talkit glanced at Shrewkit, who was following Stagpaw from the prey heap. Now I'm stuck with him. Ignore his teasing, Barkit urged. If you don't react, he'll get bored and back off. I guess, Talkit wasn't convinced. Let's go see if Lily Whisker needs help hunting fleas. He turned toward the elder's den. I'll catch up, Barkit mewed. I want to ask Heatherstar about becoming Hawkheart's apprentice. As Barkit headed for Heatherstar's den, Talkit padded toward the thick gorse at the far end of the clearing, Flame Pelt was outside the den, propped against a low hummock, while Lily Whisker sat beside him, carefully grooming her lifeless leg. Doe Paw and Rye Paw were crouching in the grass beside them, eyes fixed on Flame Pelt. The elder was mid story. I took a right fork in the tunnel, he rasped. It was darker than the inside of a rock, but I could hear the rabbit a few tail lengths ahead. It was running fast, leaving a trail of fear scent so strong even a moor runner could follow it. Isn't tunnel hunting easy? 
Dopaw interrupted. There's only one way for the prey to run. Flame Pelt met her gaze. You think it's easy to run full pelt in stone black darkness? As Dopaw's eyes widened, Whiteberry padded from the gorse den. His snowy pelt glowed in the sunshine. You've only got your ears, nose, and whiskers to guide you, he explained. One wrong paw step, and you could hit a wall. Flame Pelt leaned forward. A dead end gives a different echo from a passage. An experienced tunneler can hear whether an underpath will open out or get narrower just by the way the air ruffles his ear fur. Lily Whisker lifted her muzzle. I used to be able to hear a cavern halfway across the moor, just by the echo of my paw steps, she boasted. Whiteberry lay beside her and stretched sleepily. I could scent prey through a tail length of soil. Talkit blinked. One day he'd learn all of these skills. He knew he should feel excited, but he could only picture darkness and mud. He shivered as though he were already below ground. Flame Pelt returned to his story. The rabbit was well under Shadow Clan territory. And you followed it? Rypaw gasped. But it was Shadow Clan prey once it had crossed the border. Tunnels belong to Wind Clan, Flame Pelt rasped. Talkit padded closer. How did you know it was Shadow Clan territory when you were underground? The soil smells of pine sap, Flame Pelt told him briskly, then pressed on. The rabbit kept running. I was closing on it fast. Then I heard paw steps on the forest floor above. I was close to the surface. Dopaw's tail twitched. Could they tell you were there? Whiteberry cut in with a snort. No overgrounder can smell through earth. But they might have heard my paw steps. Flame Pelt lowered his voice. If they mistook me for a rabbit, they might start digging. I couldn't risk them discovering the tunnels. So I froze. Flame Pelt paused. I could hear the rabbit racing away, and there was fresh air wafting down the tunnel. The prey was heading for an opening. I just had to hope that the Shadow Clan patrol wouldn't spot it and chase it back underground. Did they? Rypa asked breathlessly. The Shadow Clan paw steps suddenly broke into a run. Flame Pelt told her. I heard their calls, rabbit, rabbit. His gaze widened, flicking from Dopaw and Rypaw to Talkit. The fur on Talkit's spine lifted. What happened? Earth showered around me as they pounded overhead. I had to think fast. If they found the opening and chased the rabbit back down, they'd find me and discover the tunnel. I had to block it. Block it? Rypa squeaked. How? I had to cause a cave-in, Flame Pelt announced. The soil was light and soft. If I could loosen enough to block the tunnel without bringing the whole roof down, I'd be safe. Talkit's heart began to pound. What if the whole roof had collapsed? His chest tightened. I'd have drowned in soil, Flame Pelt breathed. No! Rypa's mew was barely a whisper. I could hear Shadow Clan voices at the end of the tunnel, then the rabbit's paws thumping closer. Stronger steps were on its tail. The patrol was heading straight toward me. Flame Pelt reached up with a forepaw. I began scraping at the soil above my head. Claws out, I dug as hard and as fast as I could. The paw steps were thundering nearer, echoing against the walls of the tunnel. Another few moments and they'd smell me. A few moments after that, they'd crash right into me. I clawed at the roof with both paws until I heard the earth groaning. I stuck my paws in for a final pull, and the roof showered down. I leaped back just in time as the whole tunnel gave way in front of me. Beyond the wall of soil, I heard the squeal of the rabbit 
as the Shadow Clan patrol caught up with it. Didn't they know you were there? Dopa asked. It was too dark, and the earth scent hid my smell. Flame Pelt shrugged. As far as they were concerned, it was just a dead-end rabbit hole. I turned around and headed for home. Lily Whisker sighed. I miss those days. Flame Pelt nodded. What I wouldn't give to be running tunnels again. Whiteberry whisked his tail over his paws. There were enough tunnelers back then to patrol every tunnel. We kept them in good condition, Flame Pelt agreed. These days, if there's a cave-in, the clan just thinks it's one less tunnel to patrol. Dopa narrowed her eyes. Isn't it good that we don't have to send so many cats underground? She nodded at Lily Whisker's leg. It is dangerous. Being a war runner's not exactly safe, Flame Pelt retorted. There are buzzards and dogs and foxes above ground. They're just as dangerous as a cave-in. The better trained we are, the less risk there is. That's why we need to keep training our young'uns to tunnel. There'll come a time when we'll depend on the tunnels again. Rypaw tilted her head sideways. But there are plenty of rabbits these days. Now our territory covers the whole moor. And even in the worst snows, we can find enough to feed the clan. Flame Pelt sat up. What if another clan decides to invade our territory? Dopaw bristled. We'd fight them off. Flame Pelt's tail twitched. Tunnels give us an advantage in battle. Tallkit glanced from elder to apprentice. Had more runners and tunnelers always disagreed like this? How had Wind Clan stayed together for so many moons if the two sides felt so differently? Chapter 4 The camp entrance swished as Sandgorse padded into camp, Plum Claw and Mist Mouse at his tail. Mud streaked Sandgorse's pelt and his shoulders sagged. Tallkit hurried to greet him. Hi, Kit. Sandgorse meowed. Have you had a good day? Yes, Flame Pelt's been telling us about the time he chased a rabbit all the way under Shadow Clan territory. Ah, that's a good story. Sandgorse ran his tail along Tallkit's spine. The tip felt wet and smelled of mud. We've been working on the gorge tunnel. Sandgorse! Heather Star leaped out of the meeting hollow and crossed the camp. Reed Feather bounded after her. How's the work going? Heather Star prompted. The leader's gaze flicked over the muddy, bedraggled pelts of Plum Claw and Mist Mouse, and there was a flash of concern in her eyes. It's fine, Sandgorse reported. We've shored up the stretch beyond the peat ridge. It's steep there, but we've pulled up clay from lower down and strengthened the tunnel walls. Reed Feather narrowed his eyes. It seems like a lot of work. Plum Claw shook out her pelt. It'll be worth it when it's finished. When will that be? Heather Star asked. Mist Mouse exchanged glances with Sandgorse. It's hard to say, she meowed. We're tunneling in territory we haven't worked before. It's difficult to predict whether we're going to meet sand, clay, or stone next. Reed Feather moved beside Heather Star. It sounds dangerous. It's challenging, Sandgorse puffed out his chest. But we're learning a lot, and when it's done, Wind Clan will have a secret route from the top of the moor right down to the river. What about the cliff face? Heather Star's ears twitched. You can't tunnel through rock. We've planned for that, Plum Claw explained. There's a seam of clay just as the river drops into the deepest part of the gorge. We plan to dig up through that and meet the tunnel coming down. Won't River Clan be able to see it from the bottom of the gorge? Reed Feather asked. There are brambles, Sandgorse told him. The entrance will be hidden. He looked at Talkit. I can't wait to show you, he purred. Tallkit felt a rush of pride. 
Sandgorse could do things even the clan leader couldn't. I can't wait to see it, he mewed. You may be apprenticed in time to help finish digging it, Sandgorse purred. Talkit stiffened. Suddenly, he imagined himself at the bottom of a long tunnel, far from the sky, digging in the dark through filthy clay, desperately trying to find his way through to fresh air. He swallowed as his chest tightened. Yes, he whispered shakily. Heatherstar fluffed up her fur. You'd better get dry, she advised the tunnelers. This chilly wind will give you green cough if you're not careful. Sandgorse nodded and headed away. Come on, Talkit, he called. Help me lick the grit from behind my ears. Talkit scurried after him, catching up to Sandgorse as he reached the tunneler's bracken patch. Sandgorse stopped and shook out his pelt. Talkit screwed up his face as mud spattered him. A purr rumbled in Sandgorse's throat. You'll have to get used to mucky fur. Talkit shuddered. You're getting him dirty, Pellbird's mew rang across the camp. Talkit turned to see his mother hurrying toward them. He's helping me get cleaned up, Sandgorse objected. He wants to get the grit from behind my ears, don't you, Talkit? Talkit gazed at his father's mud-crusted head. Not really. I guess he's got to learn how, Pellbird touched her muzzle to Talkit's head. One day he'll be cleaning the grit from his own ears. Sandgorse's eyes shone. I can't wait till we can go on patrol together. He looked from Pale Bird to Tall Kid. Running tunnels, just the three of us. Pale Bird sighed. It may be a while before I join you. Sandgorse looked up sharply. What do you mean? His gaze darkened. Surely you'll be ready by the time Tall Kid's an apprentice. Palebird shook her head. I don't think I'll be strong enough. Of course you will. Sandgorse leaned forward and pressed his cheek against hers. New leaf will bring fatter prey, and you'll have your strength back in no time. Talkit stared anxiously at his mother. You'll be better, won't you? I hope so, Palebird murmured. Turning, she headed toward the nursery. Go with her, Talkit. Sandgorse whispered, I think she needs cheering up. Talkit hesitated. What about your ears? I'll wash them myself. Talkit trotted after his mother, scrambling over the tussocks until he caught up with her. The comforting scent of wool and milk enfolded him as they entered the nursery. Brackenwing sat up as Pellbird curled into her nest. The queen's pale ginger pelt was ruffled with sleep. Where are Barkit and Shrewkit? She meowed. Does she know that Barkit is planning to ask Heatherstar if he can become Hawkheart's apprentice? Talkit wondered. He figured it wasn't his place to tell Brackenwing if she didn't know. They're playing outside. He scrambled over the edge of the nest and slid in beside Palebird's belly. He was hungry. Palebird pulled away as he nuzzled into her belly. No, Talkit. Talkit froze. No? He wriggled closer, closing his eyes and breathing in his mother's tempting, milky scent. Palebird shoved him back with a paw. I said no, Talkit. No milk? He stared at her in disbelief. It's drying up, she told him. You're old enough to eat from the prey heap now. But, he searched for a way to change her mind but Pale Bird was staring at him blankly. Brackenwing's nest rustled. It's okay, Talkit. She climbed out of the heather and leaned in to lick his ears. Shrew Kit and Bar Kit have been eating from the heap for a moon. They prefer prey now. No milk at all? Talkit couldn't believe Pale Bird hadn't warned him. His mother half closed her eyes. You'll enjoy eating with the big kids she murmured. Talkit felt Brackenwing tug his scruff with her teeth. He scrabbled at the nest, snagging wool in his claws as she lifted him out. His fur spiked. It's not fair. Brackenwing lowered him gently to the floor. Let Palebird rest. 
she nosed him toward the entrance. Numbly, Talkit stumbled forward. Behind him, Brackenwing was tucking wool around his mother. You get some sleep, dear, she whispered as Palebird tucked her nose under her paw and closed her eyes. With a pang of sadness, Talkit slid from the den. He landed on the damp grass and fluffed his fur against the chill. Wool was tufted beneath his claws. He shook it out crossly and stared across the camp. The prey heap was stacked high. He could see a rabbit near the bottom with small brown mouse bodies piled on top. Belly growling, he stomped toward the heap. As he reached it, he sniffed warily. Rich scents swamped his tongue. He drew back, wrinkling his nose. First time, Plumclaw's mew made him jump. The dark gray she-cat nosed in beside him. Try a mouse first. It's not too strong and it's easy to chew. She tugged one of the little brown bodies from the heap and dropped it at his paws. Be careful of the bones. She tapped the haunches of the mouse with her soft gray foot. Take a bite, there. Talkit leaned down, trying not to breathe in the prey scent. I want milk. Closing his eyes, he sank his teeth into the soft flesh. Flavor flooded his tongue, pungent and warm. Not bad, eh? Plumclaw purred. Talkit wasn't sure. He ripped a small chunk from the mouse and looked at her. The juicy meat was strange, but not horrible. He began to chew. There you go, Plumclaw's eyes glowed. She hooked a bird from the pile with a claw and pointed to a patch of grass beside the heather wall of the camp. Let's take our meal over there and stop crowding the prey heap. Grabbing the bird between her teeth, she patted across the grass. Talkit picked up the mouse and followed. He puffed out his chest proudly as it swung from his jaws. He felt like a moor runner bringing prey home to the clan. He settled beside Plumclaw as she took a bite of her bird. This is a thrush, she explained, her mouth full. It tastes a bit woody, she swallowed. I prefer lapwing, but we only hunt them after the breeding season. Talkit took another bite of mouse. He knew what to expect this time and began to relish the chewy meat. You'll be an apprentice soon, and then you can catch your own prey, Plumclaw told him. Catch my own prey? Talkit wondered what tunnel hunting was like. Chasing rabbits in the dark couldn't be as much fun as chasing rabbits on the moor. Did you like being an apprentice? He asked Plumclaw. It was great. Plumclaw tore another mouthful from her thrush. Talkit glanced at her from the corner of his eye. Were you glad you were going to be a tunneler? Could any cat be glad to be told they would spend their life underground? Of course, Plumclaw shook a feather from her muzzle. Both my parents were tunnelers, and I knew I'd be good at it because I'm small and my paws are wide and strong. She held one up. Talkit could see mud trapped beneath her claws, even though the rest of her pelt was washed clean. Do you like being underground? Talkit tried to sound unconcerned. He didn't want her to guess he was having second thoughts about becoming a tunneler. What if she told Sandgorse? I love it, she told him. It feels like a secret world. Above me, prey runs, warriors patrol, clouds move over the moor, and no one except my tunnel mates know where we are. Don't you miss the wind in your pelt? No. Plumclaw looked at him, surprised. It's snug underground. I feel safe with the earth pressing against my fur. Talkit swallowed. You sound like you're half mole. Maybe I am. As Plumclaw purred with amusement, Barkit scrambled out of the meeting hollow. Talkit sat up as his den mate bounced toward him. Heatherstar said yes! Barkit stopped in front of him. I can be Hawkheart's apprentice! 
I didn't know you wanted to be a medicine apprentice, Plumclaw purred. Congratulations. Yeah, Talkit licked blood from his lips. Congratulations. He couldn't help feeling a pang of envy. You'll be doing what you want while I spend all day digging holes. Talkit? Barkit was frowning at him. What's wrong? Talkit lifted his chin. He wasn't being fair to his friend. Nothing, I'm really happy for you. Barkit noticed his mouse. You're eating prey! Talkit puffed out his fur proudly. It's good. I like shrew best, Barkit told him. It tastes heathery. He glanced over his shoulder at the grassy clearing. Do you want to play rabbit? Talkit took a quick bite of mouse and pushed the rest toward Plumclaw. Here. Thanks, she meowed. Are you sure you've had enough? Plenty. Talkit jumped to his paws. Shall I be rabbit this time? He asked Barkit. Barkit flicked his stubby tail. Yes. Okay, Talkit mewed. But I'm not hiding under any gorse bushes. They're way too prickly. Don't worry, Barkit reassured him. If you step on another thorn, I can always pull it out. Chapter 5 Let all cats old enough to hunt gather at Tall Rock. Blue sky framed Heatherstar as she called from the top. Behind her, the distant moor rolled wide and green, rippling with heather not quite in bloom. A soft breeze tugged at Tall Kit's pelt as he sat on the rim of the meeting hollow. His clanmates swarmed around him, streaming down into the sandy dip. A warm new leaf had brought rich prey, and now, as green leaf set in, the clan's warriors were plump and sleek. Talkit glanced at the tunnelers as they clustered at one end of the hollow. Woolly Tail's eyes were bright, and Hickory Nose paced impatiently around him while Plumclaw's tail tip flicked with excitement. Hawk Heart and Reed Feather sat still as stone at the foot of Tall Rock, while the moor runners filled up the rest of the hollow. Sit down and stop fidgeting. Cloud Runner beckoned Stagpaw with a flick of his tail. Dopaw was already waiting between Aspenfall and Rypaw. The elders clambered stiffly into the hollow, Flame Pelt leading the way. Whiteberry pressed close to Lily Whisker as she dragged her leg behind her. Flailfoot followed. This is the ceremony I've been looking forward to, he rasped. Tall Kit's heart leaped like a rabbit in his chest. Sandgore stood beside him. Are you ready? Yes. Tall Kit glanced at Palebird. Her round eyes, which had been dull for so long, were bright and focused. She leaned forward and began lapping the fur on Tall Kit's shoulders. I want you looking your best, she purred. Brown fur flashed at the entrance to the medicine den as Barkpaw hurried out. The young apprentice scrambled into the hollow and took his place beside Hawkheart. The medicine cat flashed him a reproachful look. Sorry, Hawkheart, Talkit heard Barkpaw's hushed apology. I was sorting the comfrey leaves. Shrewpaw caught Talkit's eye. He was sitting beside his mentor, Hareflight. Talkit could guess what he was thinking. You're going to be worm paw now. Talkit looked away. I'll be an apprentice, he told himself. It doesn't matter whether I'm a tunneler or a moor runner. Heatherstar leaped down from Tall Rock and crossed the hollow. She stopped in the middle and surveyed her clan until her gaze rested on Talkit. His pelt burned. Talkit! Heatherstar called. Palebird nudged him forward. Paws slipping on the dry sand, Talkit scrambled down into the hollow and stopped in front of Heatherstar. It is rare that I give an apprentice name to only one cat. Heatherstar's blue eyes bored into him. Let us remember your littermate, Finchkit. She glanced up at Palebird. 
Wind Clan mourns the loss of one so young, but she is at peace, safe with Star Clan. Talkit wondered if his littermate was watching his ceremony. Would she be jealous that she never got the chance to have her apprentice name? Perhaps Star Clan would grant her one. Tall Paw, Heatherstar's mew jerked his thoughts back. I have thought long and hard about who should mentor you. Tallpaw heard murmurs of excitement from the tunnelers. She'll choose Woolly Tail, surely, Plumclaw's whisper hissed across the hollow. Heatherstar's gaze didn't waver. I have chosen Dawnstripe. She turned her head toward the moor runners. Come forward, Dawnstripe. Tall paw gripped the earth as the ground seemed to sway beneath him. But I'm supposed to be a tunneler. He looked at Sandgorse, sitting above the hollow. His father's eyes glittered with outrage. Tall paw swallowed as Dawnstripe padded toward him. I'm not going underground. Relief fluttered deep in his belly. Heather Star, Woolly Tail's sharp mew cut across the hollow. You promised us a tunneler. Paws thumped onto the earth behind Tallpaw. He spun around, heart lurching. Sandgorse had jumped into the clearing. You've made a mistake, Heatherstar. Heatherstar shook her head. No, I haven't, Sandgorse. But I'm a tunneler. Palebird's a tunneler. We want Tallpaw to follow in our paw steps. Heatherstar dipped her head. I know. She meowed quietly, but I have watched Tallpaw. He doesn't have a tunneler's nature or physique. That's not true, Sandgore snapped. Look at this tail. It's easily long enough to pull him out of a cave-in, and he has strong paws and short fur to keep the sand out. Heatherstar held Sandgorse's gaze. He can run like the wind and leap like a hare, he chases imaginary prey when he thinks no one is watching. Pale Bird jumped down beside her mate. He can chase real prey in the tunnels, she hissed. Heatherstar didn't flinch. I've seen him when the wind's up. It gets into his fur so he can't sit still. He needs to be above ground. He needs to be true to his nature. True to his nature? Woolly Tail spat. What kit doesn't run and jump? Hickory Nose snorted. In Leaf Bear, you said that the tunnels were too dangerous. Now you say a kit likes the wind in his fur. What excuse will you use next time you give the more runners an apprentice? Sandgorse took a step closer to Heatherstar, his pelt bristling. Tunneling is in his nature, he growled. How could it not be? His kin are tunnelers stretching back for moons. Heatherstar's tail twitched. If Tallpaw wants to train as a tunneler later, he can. But I want him to train as a moor runner first. Tallpaw flinched as he saw Palebird's tail droop. She clambered out of the hollow and padded head down back to the nursery. Should I tell Heatherstar that I want to be a tunneling apprentice? Tall Paul looked desperately from the Wind Clan leader to his father. He's my son, Sandgore snarled. I'll decide his future. Heatherstar stiffened. I decide the future of my warriors. She turned to Dawnstripe. Share your speed and courage with Tallpaw. Make him a warrior the whole of Wind Clan can be proud of. Tallpaw's heart thumped like rabbit paws on hollow earth. Dawnstripe was one of Wind Clan's fastest runners and had never backed down in a fight. He could learn so much from her. I will make Wind Clan proud. He fought to stop himself from trembling as Dawnstripe touched her muzzle to his head, and he pricked his ears, listening for his clanmate's cheers. Paws shifted on the sand around him. No cat called his apprentice name. Nervously, Tallpaw glanced over his shoulder. Sandgorse had turned his tail on the ceremony. 
The tunnelers stared in stony silence. Tallpaw, Cloudrunner was the first to call his name. Hareflight joined in. Tallpaw! Tallpaw! Dawnstripe raised her voice above the others and led the chant, challenging the other moor runners to join in with the glare. As more cats began to call his name, Dawnstripe nosed Tallpaw toward Stagpaw and Dopaw. Come on, she murmured. Greet your new den mates. Tallpaw, Tallpaw! Rypaw pummeled the ground. Stagpaw's eyes shone as Tallpaw approached. Congratulations! Tallpaw's tongue felt dry. Stagpaw had never spoken to him as an equal before. As the chanting died away, Rypaw and Dopaw clustered around him. The first time you see the moor is the best, Dopa told him breathlessly. You won't believe how big it is, Rypaw fluffed out her gray fur. Barkpaw raced to Tallpaw's side. Congratulations, he mewed. Tallpaw blinked gratefully at his friend. He still didn't know how to feel. He wanted to be a moor runner, but not if it made his mother and father so angry. You may think you've been given an easier path. Tallpaw turned as a gruff mew sounded in his ear. Hawkheart was standing beside him. The gray-brown medicine cat narrowed his eyes. But it's a path that leads away from your kin. Be careful not to lose your way. Tallpaw shook his head. I won't, I promise. Barkpaw puffed out his chest. Of course he won't. Heatherstar must be crazy, Shrewpaw barged past his brother. You should be underground, worm kit. Tallpaw sniffed. I'm not a kit or a worm. I'm going to be a moor runner, just like you. Lark Splash's whiskers twitched. It'll be good to have a new apprentice in the den. She glanced at Rypaw, her gaze warm. A certain litter isn't too good at being ready in time for dawn patrol. Aspenfall purred, weaving past Dawnstripe. I bet you're an early riser, if you're anything like your father. He looked at Sandgorse. The pale ginger tunneler sat with his back to the hollow. Tallpaw's heart twisted. He dipped his head to the moor runners crowding around him. Thank you, he mumbled. I must go speak with Sandgorse. He nosed his way past Dawnstripe and Stagpaw and jumped out of the hollow. Following the rim, he headed for his father. Sandgorse? The tunneler's fur looked dull and patchy, worn thin by countless moons working underground. Tallpaw stopped in front of his father. Do you want me to tell Heatherstar I'd rather be a tunneler? Sandgorse lifted his gaze. Is that what you want? Tallpaw swallowed. Sandgorse's gaze hardened. Is it? Tallpaw shifted his paws. No, he mewed quietly. Then don't, Sandgorse snapped. I'm sorry, Tallpaw mewed. But if Heatherstar had made me a tunneler, I would have trained just as hard. I had such plans. Sandgorse's gaze drifted toward the nursery, where Palebird was hiding. I know. Tallpaw tried to ignore the guilt pricking his heart. You and me and Palebird were going to patrol together. But I promise, even though I'm training to be a moor runner, I'll be the best warrior I can be. You were born to be a tunneler. Sandgorse flashed an angry glance at Heatherstar as she sat, head bowed, beside Reedfeather in the hollow. You can't change that, no matter what any other cat tells you. Lashing his tail, he marched away. Tallpaw watched him go, grief rising in his throat. I'm sorry, he whispered. Warm breath brushed his ear. Dawnstripe. Tallpaw recognized her scent. There's nothing you can do, she meowed. Leave him. 
He'll get used to it. Tall Pa looked up hopefully at her. Will he? Don Stripe didn't answer. Instead, she nodded toward the camp entrance. Come on, I bet you're desperate to see what's outside. She bounded across the grass, clearing the tussocks easily. Tall Paw raced after her, zigzagging between them. He'd jump them one day soon, when his legs were stronger from training. As a moor runner, I'm going to be a moor runner. He stopped at the camp entrance and watched Don Stripe's gold-banded tail disappearing through the narrow gap in the heather that marked the entrance to the camp. For the first time in his life, Tallpaw was going to see what lay beyond the heather walls. He pushed his way through the gap. Heather fronds swished over his pelt, and he half closed his eyes as they flicked his muzzle. As soon as he cleared the branches, wind swept over his face. Opening his eyes wide, Tallpaw emerged onto a patch of wind swept grass and stared at the wide heath stretching out before him. Gray clouds massed on the horizon beyond a sea of wind-whisked heather. The moor rolled away on all sides, sloping up beyond the camp and dropping below where they stood. Gorse sprouted here and there, yellow against the green heather, clumping in thick swaths like patches of sunshine. Now that he was outside, Tallpaw could see that the Wind Clan camp was nestled in a natural hollow, its grassy clearing hidden by the thick, leafy walls. What do you think? Muzzle high, Don Stripe stood on a grassy hillock a few tail lengths away and looked down at him. It's huge, Tallpaw whispered. He dug his claws into the grass to steady himself against the buffeting wind. He felt an urge to charge into the heather and run as far as he could, but fear rooted his paws to the spot. What if he ran all the way out of the territory? What if he couldn't find his way back to camp? Look, Don Stripe flicked her tail to the slope on the far side of the camp. Birds were swooping low to the heather, then lifting high into the sky before turning for another dive. Lapwings, Don Stripe explained. They're defending their young. There must be a weasel nearby. A weasel? Tallpaw blinked at her. He'd never seen one of those on the fresh kill pile. Were weasels dangerous? He glanced around nervously. Stay clear of them until you've learned some fighting moves, Don Stripe instructed. They're fast and vicious, and their bites carry infection and they taste dreadful, so don't bother trying to catch one to eat. Shrewpaw burst from the tunnel and stared at Tallpaw. Looking for rabbit holes to burrow in? Stagpaw pushed past him. Stop blocking the entrance, rabbit brain. Shrewpaw stumbled clear as Doepaw, Hareflight, Rypaw, Aspenfall, Lark Splash, and Cloud Runner streamed out behind him. Cloud Runner stopped beside Dawn Stripe. Congratulations on getting an apprentice, he purred. Where are you taking him first? Stagpaw butted in before the golden tabby could answer. We're practicing battle moves. Cloud Runner glanced sternly at his apprentice. Once we've finished practicing, not interrupting. Sorry, Stagpaw dropped his gaze. A purr rumbled in Dawn Stripe's throat. He's just excited to have a new den mate. She glanced at Tallpaw. Are you ready? Tallpaw nodded. Behind Don Stripe, the moor swept down toward dense, dark green trees. Tallpaw could hear their leaves rustling from here. The trees grew so close, he imagined it being as dark as a tunnel underneath. Is that where ThunderClan lives? He whispered. How could they see to catch their prey? That's right, Don Stripe meowed. Don't worry, we're not going to pay them a visit. Lark Splash paced the grass, her tortoise shell and white pelt ruffled by the breeze. I'm taking Rypaw to the River Clan border to refresh the scent line. 
Shall we travel together? Dawnstripe nodded. She sprang down from the grassy hillock and disappeared into a gap in the heather. Tallpaw hurried after her. As he ducked between the thick branches, he noticed that the grass under Paw was worn into a track of bare brown earth. He smelled rabbit, though the scent was stale. Rypaw was trotting at his heels. Just wait till you get to Outlook Rock, she mewed. You can see to the end of the world from there. Tallpaw followed the rabbit trail as it swerved through the heather. Dawnstripe's golden tail tip flashed in and out of sight, and Tallpaw quickened his pace, worried he'd hold the others back. The trail widened until he could see Dawnstripe racing ahead. Clumps of black dirt littered the path like bunches of dark berries, and Tallpaw hopped and jumped, trying to avoid stepping on them. Sheep dirt, Rypaw explained. Alarm pricked Tallpaw's pelt. Were there sheep here? Sheep were huge. He'd seen their white backs looming beyond the camp walls. He jerked his head around. Have you seen one up close? Of course, Rypaw purred. They're harmless. You could walk under their bellies and they wouldn't notice. They just live to chew and make dirt. She bounded over a large clump of dirt berries. The ground began to slope down as Heather gave way to wind-flattened grass. It felt soft and damp beneath Tallpaw's pads. Ahead of Dawnstripe, the moor rolled onward like a gigantic green cat sleeping under the blue sky. Tallpaw tasted the air. Sheep dirt, rabbit, and Heather swamped his tongue. Was their enemy scent hidden among all that? Tall Paw closed his eyes for a moment to concentrate. Tall Paw, no!